Welcome, everybody. Let's start the afternoon session. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Richard Stele from Humboldt University in Berlin. And uh, he will be presenting us an analysis about the CAPM in Germany. Thank you. Let me start. And now the, the version presently that is on SSR is an older version and you put a new version on there very soon. Okay, so I'm actually a retired professor, which is a very nice situation because I don't have to teach undergraduates anymore. But otherwise I do the same things. Okay. Now we talked about the capital asset pricing model all morning explicitly or implicitly let me just review it for a couple of seconds it's one of the most important models in the area of finance and it simply says that on any asset on any asset that is on stocks or real estate everything should have an expected rate of return which is a linear function of this variable which is the non-diversifiable risk of the asset. Actually, it's the standardized non-diversifiable asset. This is an important uh, thing. The non-diversifiable risk is standardized by the variance of the market portfolio. Now, the market portfolio plays a, a very important role. The market portfolio, we need to calculate the beta. The, the beta is the covariance of the asset with the market portfolio. But also, we need the market portfolio, which includes all assets on which we have data on. It includes all assets. This is the expected rate of return on the market portfolio. And the market portfolio is a market value weighted uh, number, so each asset's rate of return we weigh by its market value proportion and then we get the expected rate of return on the market portfolio. Now what the capital asset pricing model says, there is only one determinant of the expected rate of return on an asset, it's its beta, and other asset characteristics do not matter. Now the capital asset pricing model is based on very clear and very strong assumptions. I don't go into them, just I want to say they exist. And what I also want to emphasize is that a considerable number of other asset pricing models exist, which we have heard of partly uh, this morning. My major contribution to the literature was an international capital asset pricing model in 1976 and this is actually my publication that has been quote, uh, cited most often in the literature. Now this is the capital asset pricing model. There are many versions. However, the most important alternative at the present time I consider the Pharma French three-factor model. And in the Pharma French three-factor model, two additional factors are included, firm size, how large a firm is, and the book-to-market ratio. So we have three factors, and I actually only compare the capital asset pricing model to the three-factor model because I believe this is the most important alternative. Fulvio, is he still here? He, uh, discussed more complicated capital asset pricing models, more recent capital asset pricing models, which I think are, at this point in time, not as important as this uh, standard capital asset pricing model and as the three-factor three pricing model of uh, Pharma French. Now, who uses those models? Uh, it's actually, it's 
several important money managers do. Most importantly, dimensional fund advisors uses the Pharma French three-factor model. Now, dimensional fund advisor uh, is a huge uh, mutual fund uh, company, and Pharma French are sitting on the board of this uh, company. And they are the only institutional investor, the only company that listens to people like me, to professors. The others also listen, but not as much. So dimensional fund advisors listen to especially Pharma French. Other money managers, other banks, they often use more complicated models. But the question is, are they successful? And are their customers successful? Most are not because transactions cost and administrative costs are too high. And we heard this morning, customers go into and out of the funds too often. So actually, there are very many sophisticated models around, but the investors uh, do not profit from it. Now, for me, the most important application of the capital asset pricing model is that in most industrialized countries, all the countries I know, the capital asset pricing model is used in the regulation of network industries. A network industry is a mobile phone company or a, f a fixed line telephone company or a gas company that has gas pipelines. And all of these companies have monopolies and because of this they are regulated by the government and uh, these regulators always use the capital asset pricing model and I wrote the paper to tell the German regulators they should continue to use the capital asset pricing model. So whenever you make, in Germany, when somebody makes a phone call, kind of, and he has to pay then a telephone bill, the capital asset pricing model goes into the telephone bill. Every single call is made. Every electricity bill that is sent around in Germany, the electricity bill depends on the capital asset pricing model. Okay. So this is the most important uh, application. And if you want to read about it, the Australian Energy <coughs> Regulator, Australian Energy Regulator, it's easy to find with Google, just put out a statement, better regulation. Now this is a 100 page uh, paper. And in the appendix, they discuss the capitalist pricing model and the pharma French model from their point of view and very, in very great detail. So this is, if you want to know how the capital asset pricing model is used in the real world, uh, go to this uh, document by the Australian Energy Regulator. It, it's the latest document, December 2013. In Italy, the, can somebody help me? Autorita per Energia Elect... Okay, they also use the capital asset pricing model. So, Kind of the capital asset pricing model is really used uh, in the real world. And in many countries, it's also used in legal procedures in which the two parties fight about the value of a firm. So in Germany, we have a large number of legal procedures. They go to, people go to court about the value of a company, mostly a, a company that is list, not listed anymore, and then the judge also bases his judgment today on the capital asset pricing model. Now, we test the standard, the capital asset pricing model versus this alternative, the Pharma French three factor model, and we just use really traditional test procedures. Now, in the Fulvio, he described some new test procedures, but these are not the ones that are fully accepted by the uh, field of finance. These are the standard test procedures which are still the most likely used. Black, Jensen, Scholz, 1972, Gibbons, Ross, Schenken, 1989, Pharma, Macbeth, 1973, and Pharma, French, 1992. They have a solid economic metric foundation and they are discussed continuously. At this time, we do only tests based on characteristics of firms 
and not on factors they also were mentioned uh, this morning. Let me just also briefly summarize the underlying models. So the underlying model in most of the test is a model which originally was called market model and today most often is called the sin single index model and it says that the rate of return on a stock is a linear function of the rate of return on the market and in this linear function we have this beta. Now if we combine this statistical model with a capital asset pricing model which is an economic equilibrium model we get the equation the rate of return on a stock in a time period t for example in a month minus the risk free rate is equal also to this right hand side but this alpha should be zero so basically these many tests just focus on this alpha and ask whether this alpha is zero. So in the tests of Black, Jensen, Scholz, Gibbons, Ross, Schenken, the H0 hypothesis is the alpha I is zero. If this is the case, we do not reject the capital asset pricing model, but if the alpha is significantly different from zero, then the capital asset pricing model is rejected. Now these equations like this or procedures like this are, are called time series tests because we look at time series of rate of return on stocks or most often on portfolios. So we look at specific portfolios, look at them for a long time period and then look if the alpha is significantly different from zero. We also have cross-sectional tests, actually time series of cross-sectional tests. So we do an equation like this typically for every month and in every month we have the beta, the size of the firm and the book to market ratio as independent variables and we check how the average of these variables over time, especially the average of the constant here which should be zero or is uh, over time what type of average we get. Too fast, too slow. Can you understand my English? <laughs> A large number of capital asset pricing model exists for the US, starting in 1972. So this is not just 20 or 100, this is a couple hundred tests exist. So it's very difficult to keep track of them. And we have tests on the US, on the whole world, on individual countries, on regions, and basically each month an important new study comes out. And it's so, because it's so important economically, because a lot of money is involved, basically we have lots of tests. And if somebody, if a young academic today would develop a good test, he would immediately got, get a job at Harvard, Stanford, Princeton or Yale, at the top universities where people, young people make three times as much money as a German university professor gets. So the, what is involved economically is a lot of money in these uh, tests. Many anomalies, many anomalies have been identified. Anomaly is a term that refer, refers to systematic deviations from the capital asset pricing model. So something, there is a characteristic of a stock or of stocks that systematically over long time periods affected returns and then this we call an anomaly and such anomalies exist very many. The question is are they stable over time and which one are the most important ones? So there are at least 10 to 20 anomalies but they are related to each other and the question is what is the most important one? Is size and book to market, are these the most important ones? This is what Pharma French argue but others argue differently. Now several capital asset pricing model tests exist for Germany and they also get diff different results. 
what we do here in this uh, paper and in this presentation, we use a high quality database of the German stock market that covers 50 years. Now, having good data, I think, is extremely important. The first thing I learned when I was a doctoral student was garbage in, garbage out, when you use a computer. So kind of, if you, have, if you do not have good data, what you get out of the computer is not predictable. So you need very good data. And over the years, kind of, I have developed, it took me 30 years to build up a nice, good database of the German market, 30 years, and 20, 30 persons were involved. We do many different tests, depending how, how we, you count. We use the standard procedure in this paper. We vary a number of tests, test details uh, in these tests, so the tests can have basic econometric uh, properties, but then you can vary many details of these tests and the results are very sensitive in how you vary the test details. We especially emphasize that small and large firms should not be weighted equally in these statistical tests. So in Germany, like in all capital markets, we have very small companies. A small company in Germany presently has a market value of the equity of 20, 30 millions. And a large company has a market value of 30, 40 billions. So the large companies are a thousand times larger than the small ones. And in the standard statistical procedures, they are all counted as observations and all have an, in, have an identical weight. So they all go into the results in the same way, which I think is highly problematic. If a large company deviates from the capital asset pricing model, it should be weighted more heavily than if a very minor company deviates. Let me discuss data quality, what I mean in more detail, because data quality uh, is my hobby to some extent. Now, in the first presentation this morning, the data about the US was used, and the real return on the US stock market is 6.3% now up to the most recent data for data from 1900 to 2012. Actually, this is taken from Dims and Mars, Mars Staunton from the Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns yearbooks. You can Google for it very easily, and it gives you the long-term, more than 100-year returns for a number of countries. Now, this is what I could do this morning during the presentations because I thought this is uh, interesting for this audience. Now, stocks are in the first column. Stocks, we have countries in which the real rate of return during the last 100 years was more than 6% per year. Australia is especially lucky because they are so far away uh, from our continent and they have a lot of raw materials uh, in their country. So these countries have a very high uh, long-term rate of return. Then there are countries, Germany, France and Belgium, which have a real rate of return during the last 100 years uh, around 2.5 to 3.1 percent. We had two big catastrophic wars in, in Europe which dis destroyed many things and so it's quite normal that in, in Europe the long-term rate of return on stocks should be lower. However, then in this data collection there is also data for Italy and for Austria and here the long-term rate of return is extremely low. Now I think the reason is that this data is incorrect and this data is not correct. So people just were not careful enough in collecting the data for this country. It's extremely compli complicated to collect stock market data because you do not need only stock prices. You need dividends, you need rights issue, you need stock splits, all kind of things. So it's extremely complicated. And for Italy and Austria, I think, uh, 
the data at the present time is not good enough, so I would like to uh, find an Italian colleague who checks over the long-term data for Italy, and then I think Italy move, would move up to this group, because Italy was essentially the same as Belgium, and essentially the same as France, so the, the difference should not be as large. However, now, Belgium, last, until last year, was down in this group, and then a Belgian academic did a, a very uh, detailed study on the Belgian market. And initially, Belgium was here 0.5% per year. But then after this study, it moved up to 2.5%. Uh, you mean that one checks the first version of the multiple, right? They are, they, they are available for each year. And if you look in prior years, uh, it, uh, it contains a very low number for Belgium. And uh, actually, in the current book which I have with me, I can show it later on if somebody asks, they remark that for Belgium they found a new source for the data. And so this is, so this is how it goes. Many years ago, for many countries, the numbers were lower. Now, more higher quality in stock market data means that the returns are higher because all the things I mentioned, dividends, stock splits, rights issue, they all affect the rate of return in a positive way. So if you don't include rights issues or stock splits, the resulting rates of return are lower. So this is one thing about data quality. Now, what I have here is estimates of the rate of return on the German market, the German market portfolio, the portfolio of all German stocks. And there are different people who estimate this. Professor Mami and Flavia Puma also made an estimate. This is uh, this line. The most recent estimate is by Fuazzini. This is, he's an American. And each point is the average of five years data of the rate of return on the market. Five years monthly return on the market, 60 monthly return, and the average. So these are rolling means. And what you see is basically there are very many time series which are nearly identical. They differ only a little and it all can be explained. But then these two time series, they are much lower. So this is basically much lower. And this is the Frazzini estimate here is minus point, minus 1%, while other estimate it's zero. So the differences are large and this is has to do with the quality of the underlying data. These are rolling means, but on a monthly basis. So it's always 60. Each point in this graph is based on the prior 60 months. And then, because each month they differ, and here it's, it's summarized well. But I think we already cleared it up. Okay, so 60 months, and uh, what you see is basically the 60 month average of returns differs uh, over time. We have some five year periods in which we uh, had 1.5% per month. 1.5% per month is 18% per year, so this is a very high return for five years. But in the German stock market, we also had five year periods in which it was minus 0.7 uh, according to the major uh, estimates. And this paper is also Pharma French Factors for Germany, which set is best, is also on SSR, available on SSRN. And if you want to hear my presentation, I will present it at the end of this month in Rome. There is a meeting of the European Financial Management Association and I will present the paper there because I think it's an important, uh, it's an important paper. Excuse me. There uh, was a question, I, yes. Yes, sorry. I, I haven't understood what is the, why there is this difference in the return. I mean, maybe it's a very... Uh, 
Okay, because so it's because of the these data. different, they are, all these estimates are based on different databases. And the databases con uh, contain different stocks. Ah, okay. And over time, for example, now this is, uh, this is the official CDEX index. Okay, so this is presently the, the ultimate standard. Now, Pharma French had made an estimate. They get the data from dimensional fund advisors. Then we have an M MSCI. This is internationally the most uh, popular index for Germany. We have an estimate which we call our all. It includes all German stocks. And so it depends which stocks are included and also how detailed are all stock splits included. So my, uh, these this database, I would say, they do not include all rights issues. And rights issues are a big part of the return stockholders receive. So typically in Germany, when a company issues rights and new equity, the investors get a letter, do you want to sell your right? And then you can sell it for quite some money, or you can also uh, buy new stocks. So rights issues are very important. There are stock dividends, there are cash dividends, which are cash. Oh, okay, there are cash dividends, and then there are also stock dividends. Stock dividends means you get additional stocks, and the question is, are they all these stock dividends are all included in the calculations? So it's just the, the data is not accurate enough, and the way you have to imagine is that Ten years ago, nobody was interested in this data for Germany, kind of. And then suddenly, there was a lot of interest now worldwide for this data. And now we have a lot of firms offering this data, but they cannot create in a very short time, they cannot create the best databases on the whole world. So for individual countries, uh, the quality of the data which is available in in a commercial databases and in academic based databases, very good enough. Okay, now we look at test procedures, and we, we I already mentioned we look at variations in the test procedures, and very many details are Germany specific, and we have a strong opinion how it should be done. So we do it in the way we think it should be done, which I want to discuss here. This is not of great interest to you, but, uh, but then other test details and possible interactions between them, we do not have strong beliefs. That is, we do not know how the test should be done. Or we want to demonstrate the effects of variations in the test details. And these are, for example, how should we calculate, how should we calculate the beta? There are different ways of calculate the beta. We alternate, alternatively use OLS betas. These are simple betas. Also, Dimson betas, Dimson betas uh, uh, differ a little bit, especially for small firms. They try to take illiquidity into account. We use full period betas. That is, we now look at full time periods of 50, 60 years, and then each stock or each portfolio just have, has one beta. But then we also do variations in which we have rolling betas. That is, the betas vary over time Typically, we have five-year rolling betas. We use month betas based on monthly data, 60 prior month, quarterly data, in which only the quarterly uh, data is taken into account, and annual betas. So this goes into the line some uh, persons, some presenters said, in the long run, our models are more stable. And in the long run, things are more predictable. So the capital asset pricing model, the question is, should we use monthly betas or betas based on annual data? 
we do tests for monthly, quarterly, and annual rates of return. That is sometimes we just look at monthly data, sometimes on quarterly and sometimes annual data, because the capital asset pricing model does not specify the length of the time period. So the capital asset pricing model is a very abstract model. It doesn't say it should be monthly or it should be quarterly. We use data on individual firms. This is what Pharma French did in uh, 1992 in the same way. And we use portfolio data. Portfolio data is used typically in studies uh, of this type because portfolio data has some uh, good properties. Now, when we use portfolio data, we have to create portfolios. We sort have to sort stocks into portfolios, and here we use alternative sorting procedures. We look at equal weight portfolios and value weight portfolios, and I already mentioned we should uh, basically uh, use value weight portfolio, but most studies up to two or three years ago always weighted things equally. Now, in all our tests, we look at two sub periods, 1960 to 1990, which is a 30 year time uh, span, and 1990 to 2012. And in some tests, we also do five year periods. And we do several hundred uh, tests, which I will not explain in all detail, but uh, in which we vary these test details to see how it turns out. And we think the weighting is uh, a very important uh, aspect, which I will not discuss here now, because this is a little bit more technical. I'll go on to to our main results. I don't know when uh, the organizers will cut me off. This happens very often to me. I'm just cut off at the end. And, uh, and so I typically present my results a little bit early so that at least you get to see the results. We have the additional factor size, size of a firm, and book to market, and they both play an important role in the German capital market. However, both effects and their interaction are not stable over time and across portfolio. So we have here effects that vary over time, especially from 1960 to 1990. In Germany, we observe a regular size effect. That means small firms had higher returns than large firms. This is a regular size effect. And actually, I think in 1996, I was a very proud middle-aged person that uh, published a paper in Germany, we have a size effect. However, from 1990 to 2012 in Germany, we have a strong reverse size effect, that in this time period, the large firms had higher returns than the small firms. And I fully expect that in the long run, this will also be the case in other markets. It's just that large firms today have a lot of advantages. A large firm in Germany, they have international customers. They sell into each region of this world, Mercedes-Benz. They produce these high quality cars which nobody actually needs, but which are an important status symbol. And so if presently, if the Chinese have too much money, the Mercedes-Benzes are sent to China. And in a couple of years, may, maybe possibly the Brazilians uh, have a good uh, economy, and then the Brazilians will demand Mercedes's. And so Mercedes is basically because of this internationality, and they can send the cars into each region of the world. I think this is a big advantage in, in the modern world. And we have a first uh, a moderate regular size effect, and then in, from 1990 to 2012, a strong reverse size effect. Possibly it also had to do with the European uh, community, which was established with Germany becoming a united country, so there could be a lot of reasons. 
Similarly, the, the book to market effect is also varies over time. It is more important than the size effect. It varies less, but still it varies over time. And then our main result is also details, test details like grouping, weighting, beta calculation, and the return interval, as well as the interactions, have an enormous effect on the results. So we always should do a number of tests to see uh, if the results are robust. Based on these tests, we recommend to regulators and judges in Germany to estimate the cost of, cap of equity capital in Germany uh, with the sharp lindner capital asset pricing model, with the traditional capital asset pricing model. The traditional capital asset pricing model has a nice theoretical foundation, and the, we have favor favorable empirical results for the sharp lindner capital asset pricing model and we have basically inconclusive results for the other models. So uh, we also have inconclusive models for the black capital asset pricing model, which is also an important version. <coughs> now, let me go through a little bit an exercise to see you, to make you understand betas better. So how do betas basically function? And this is one of my graphs, one of the ten, my ten best graphs in my life. So this shows the betas of size portfolios over time. Okay, this shows the betas of size portfolios over time. So. First in the US, in the top in the US, later on, on the bottom in Germany, we construct size portfolios. Now, in this, in the red line, these are the largest companies, and a portfolio of the largest companies is formed, and as you see, the largest companies in the US, they always has a, have a beta around one. This, Five minutes? Okay. So the beta is very constant, but the small companies, the beta varies a lot, and this has to do with the fact that the average beta should be equal to one. So when the large companies, the beta just goes up a little bit, then the small companies go down a lot because the market value weighted average of the beta should be one, and so. I mean, if you look at the paper, this look at these graphs, uh, I think they are nice. Okay. This is now the first set of tests. And actually what we do here, we form 16 portfolios. 16 portfolios on the basis of size and book to market. So we first sort firms according to the size in four portfolios, and then we have sub-portfolios for the book-to-market ratio. And here we do it for the whole time period, and here from 60 to 90, and here from 19 to 12. What we look at is excess rates of return, that is rates of return in excess of the risk-free rate. And what you see is from 60 to 90 small companies had very high returns, excess rate of return of 0.8 per month, which translates to 10% per year. But then 19 to 212, the small companies did not perform very well. 19 to 212, the large companies had very high returns, excess rates of return 1.16 per month on the average, which translates to uh, 14% per year excess rates of return, which is really a lot for a time period of 30 years. So this is, makes an immense difference. Here we calculate the alphas, which I discussed before, 
and then we do the standard tests whether the alphas are significantly different from zero. And here in this, this is the per procedure that was suggested by Black, Jens, and Scholz. It uh, looks only at these 16 portfolios, and we see then the alphas are significant in some, uh, for some portfolios. Here, the, these portfolios down there from 60 to 90 have a very strong positive alpha, and these have a very negative alpha, and down there it's just 90 to 212, the, it's just the other way around. So the, the alphas are significant and positive here and significant and negative uh, down there. Okay, so this doesn't go through. Well, okay. So this is the GRS test, which I will not explain. Possibly a few of you know it, but uh, so this is also a very nice test. And in the next graph, we look at the GRS test, and this test looks at all the 16 portfolios we just looked at, at all of them combined. So here we have test statistics for all portfolios together, and the green ones say it's fully in line with the capital asset pricing model, and the gray ones say, well, the capital asset pricing model is to some, rejected, some uh, extent rejected. But if you go down here, if we look at annual data, the capital asset pricing model is not rejected, and uh, so it depends how we look at it. Here we look at GRS tests only on the basis of five-year periods, and what we see, these tests, these alphas combined, are mostly fully in line with the capital asset pricing model only in the time period uh, 2000 to 2005 when we had the uh, stock market crash. In this time period, the capital asset pricing model didn't function well. Okay, so we have many more tests, and uh, what is also a critical thing, these tests assume that the residuals are normal, and this is not uh, what most of us would think, and for most five-year intervals, the GRS tests cannot reject the capital asset pricing model, and overall, we interpret the whole uh, spectrum of the results as being positive. And then we look at the Pharma Macbeth type of uh, studies. Let me just uh, do very many. Here we look at nine portfolios, 16 portfolios, 25 portfolios, and 36 portfolios and it's always size and book to market portfolios, and we use monthly rolling betas. And what you see is basically the, the intercept is, uh, in most cases, not statistically significant. Okay, you want to cut me off. <laughs> okay, now there, it goes on. So basically this, the details of the papers are not suited for an audience like this. It's just a large number of tests and the tests are typically in favor of the capital asset pricing model. And the important message is you, just, you should not do one single test, but you have to vary the test details and then to check how robust is, is the result. Okay, I thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, the remark you made about the fact that uh, Globalization provides a competitive advantage to large companies, which could be responsible for the different behavior of the size effect, the reverse size effect you observed recently, which is also visible in the value matrix. I mean, the large value becomes uh, winning in the last 20 years, whereas it was short, small value was winning in the previous okay, 30 years. Good observation. 
suggests that there may be something like a regime shift, which, by the way, it happened. I mean, Germany, it happened something to Germany in 1990, to my knowledge. Well, actually, just shortly before. So it would have a substantial political basis uh, uh, internally and, and also globally, because it didn't happen only in Germany. So did you test? Uh, did you think of trying to see if it's possible to say that one has two regimes? I mean, one where you have... Okay, we couldn't do everything, but it's a good suggestion. Now, we divided the whole time period in two parts, and one part was 60 to 90, because in the US, many capital asset pricing tests end in 1990, so a lot of tests by Pharma French end in 1990. So this is a, a subdivision that is in line with prior studies, but to some extent it's arbitrary, but I don't think it would vary much if we uh, vary the the division uh, of our sub-samples. But, good but something important check. happened in that time, especially oh, okay. in your uh, countries. I mean, there, there things, may be some reasons a for A lot it. of things happen in our stock markets. Something that is very related is that today we have less initial public offerings. We have only few initial public offerings in most countries all around the world. And there is an important paper by Jay Ritter, and he says, well, 20 years ago, people uh, did an IPO, but today the owners try to sell to a large firm. They try to sell to Google because Google can market the products much faster. Google is, is another uh, case uh, for the argument that large firms have really done well in the last uh, 30 years, also in the United States. However, Pharma French, they still hang on to their old model and don't want to admit that the size effect has become negative, but eventually they will. <laughs> uh, just a quick question, maybe following up from uh, the globalization. You said you estimated betas in all sorts of different ways. Uh, is any of those ways, or, or are all of those ways company betas against the German market, or did you try more global markets, like the European market or the These world market? Tests we just tested a local capital asset pricing model in which we just had a German market portfolio. Actually, there are very many different ways of testing it internationally. We could say the, U the common market is a, a capital market uh, for itself, and the United States is separate. Or we could take a global perspective and say the whole world is the market portfolio. Now, this we started with and possibly later on we also will test a European market uh, index and the United and the world market index but I have to find young people who do it uh, I'm told for that yes 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 yeah yeah yes okay so this is the next step and actually yes there's a lot of arguments for having a European capital asset pricing model, I would call it. Now, including all the emerging market is also kind of a, a little bit adventurous. But uh, the European market, possibly uh, Europe plus the United States, is a, during the last 30 years has been a, a fully integrated market. We have to look at a longer time period. That is the problem. And the capital markets became international only around 1985 or so. My dissertation was on international capital asset pricing, and it's in the Journal of Finance 1976 or so, where I tested whether U.S. stocks are priced nationally or internationally. So I'm actually, I would prefer an international model, but this paper was written for the regulators and the judges, and they up to now use a local capital asset pricing model. But good comment. I try to build on the observation of uh, uh, Stefano. I think that uh, uh, one uh, crucial characteristic of uh, the big f German films is uh, the innovative capacity. And this is becoming more and more relevant yeah. in recent years. This is, I think, the one of the reasons why the big companies are now such profitable with respect to small company which have. Because they, they are international or? But they, they have a innovative capacity. They have a research capacity. 
Yes, they have a research capacity. Yes. This speaks the difference between big German companies and small German and small Italian. Well, Google is the same. Google yes, Google is, a, is a, but and, and all the same. But yes. Of course, Google is a, perhaps a, a company by its own. Yes, but it's a single case. But uh, I mean, BMW, uh, Mercedes, uh, Bayer, they are firms that make a lot of research and uh, make a lot of innovation. And this so them large companies can have larger research centers, and the research centers are more stable over time. So basically, at Daimler-Benz, they have a research center, and it's typically people move in and out, but it's a fairly stable uh, from the personnel. While in small firms, uh, a firm may be successful, and the people in it, the research uh, part of the firm, they move on to a larger companies because it pays more. So, yes, good point. Okay, so let's thank again Richard.